song of the Lord and the... Well, we'll get, we, we did that, I think the songs of the Lord was last week. Something yeah. By the way, we have all of these on my website, all of these teachings. So if you want that, then we can help you with it. Or we can get you a CD with them all on, whichever is easier. All right. So what God did was I wrote down all. I did the homework. Remember, the homework is doing what God says. Then I take it back to him and say, Lord, I don't understand what I'm reading. And what he would do is take a principle from each scripture and give it to me to teach me about the prophetic. Any way that God has ever spoken in scripture, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that's why... When I look at scripture, I don't look at it as a time issue. In this dispensation, they did this, but it's no longer good for this dispensation. I look at the principles of God and how did God move? Yes, in each dispensation, he used different vehicles. But the principles of God are the same. In you know, One of the things that we talked about last week, in every generation there is a new sound there's a new sound of worship and if we do not recognize that sound of that fresh sound we might not hear God with that people and so we've got to be able to listen to what God is saying and is what I'm hearing according to the principle not according to the specific and what's hap what, the reason we have denominations is we've gone according to the specific and left the principles alone. And so God is correcting that. God's going to bring his body together. In some senses, whether we like it or not. Because he said he'd do it. It's just, I often say, hurry up, God. <laughs> okay? Now in Job 12, 7 through 9. But ask now the beasts, and they shall... T Wait a minute. Ask the beasts, and they shall teach thee? And the fowls of the air, and they shall tell thee? Or speak to the earth, and it shall teach thee? And the fishes of the sea shall declare unto thee, Who knoweth not in all these things that the hand of the Lord hath wrought this? Number one, beasts, God drawing our attention to something in the animal world and highlighting a prophetic interpretation of it. Second of all, the fowls of the air. The same principle applies. One of the things in scripture is it talks about clean and unclean beasts. And when God uses those in a dream, in a vision, or draws our attention to it and speaks from it, we need to understand that. Okay? The earth, its structure, its growth patterns, the geography, all of those things. I remember one time the Lord said to me, Bill, how many have read the scripture, out of your innermost being shall flow? What? Rivers, plural, of living water. And so I'm seeking the Lord, and the Lord said, there are seven rivers in God. And of course, being the antagonist that I am, I said, no, they're not. <laughs> he said, study out the rivers that I name. And guess what? God was right. There were seven. And God wants at least one of those, if not several of those, to flow out of the believer as he or she matures okay so then he said now i want you to see this is what i call internal geography he said i want you to study the mountains and i thought well you know there's mount aaron and the mount the mountains in the in the promised land and the lord said no i want you to study my seven mountaintop experiences 
when I was here on earth during those three and a half years. And it turned out there were seven mountains. And God began to deal with me and say, look, you, when I speak something to you and I use geography, you've got a world within. Ecclesiastes 3 and 11 says, God has made everything beautiful in his time and has put the world where? In our hearts. And I thought, huh? The world external cannot get into the, cannot get you if the world internal has been purified. In Song of Solomon, it says in chapter 4, verses 12 through 16, it describes her as a garden. And God began to say, the Garden of Eden was what I want to make within you. And see, we look at all these things and we don't relate them to life. And God is speaking prophetically. And in, Okay, I'm a tree of righteousness. Bible says so, right? What kind of tree? Are you a cherry tree? Are you an apple tree? Are you a cinnamon tree? Are you a myr myrtle bush? Or are you a nut tree? Never mind. Don't go there. All right. <laughs> but, but are you hearing me? The earth can speak to us. The beasts can speak to us. God can use those. And the fish of the sea, God can use those to speak to us. But we have narrowed it to us, thus saith the Lord. Oh, I better not go too far. Proverbs 30 and verse 1. The words of Agur, the son of Jacob, even what? The prophecy, which the, uh, the prophecy, the man spake unto Ithel, the son of, or even unto Ithel and uncle. Proverbs 30, 18. Now, now everything after that, in Proverbs 30, is prophetic. Have we looked at Proverbs 30 and the way of the eagle in the air? There, there are three things which are too wonderful for me. This is Solomon. Yea, for which I know not. The way of the eagle in the air. It's prophetic. And we know that because in Revelation chapters Four and five, one of the faces of the cherubim is the flying eagle. Okay? The way of the serpent on the rock. Who's the rock? There's only one rock. His name is Jesus. We do not understand often, and we've said this, why does God allow Satan to do that? We don't understand the way of God and his use of the enemy to strengthen us, to challenge us, and to actually purify us. Because what he produces causes us to see something in us that we don't like and that God wants to clean up. Okay? The way of a ship in the midst of the sea and the way of a man with a maid. One day... Uh, I was in a group for a while that talked about a lot about the way of the man with the maid and, and they used it to keep women in submission. By the way, one of the things you'll find, anything, any truth that is, or any teaching that is not of God will always repress the women. Remember, that God, in creating male and female, made no difference. The difference is part of the curse. Read what God said the curse was. Woman, thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. You don't see any of that in chapter 1. It says he made them both 
in his image. God's, he, he actually made man dual. Man was dual personality. He wasn't schizophrenic. He was dual, dual personality. Because he made them male and female. And when he put Adam to sleep, he brought the female out. Why? Because the women can show a measure and a side of God that men cannot. And they too, and he had to have, he had to have an illustration of the son and his bride. And on the cross, the last Adam, God reached into his side. He opened his side through the spear of the Roman soldier and blood and water flowed out and he brought, he began to bring the bride out of the side of the son. It's the same thing, isn't it? So when we look at creation and how God made man and woman, we can know how God is going to do it in the end time as he raises up a mature body of people. He's going to have a bride, a glorious church. What's the rest of that? Without spot or wrinkle, what's the rest of that? Or any such thing. I've been asking God for years, what's the any such thing? <laughs> but see, God's going to have what he said he'd have. And it doesn't matter, in one sense, the opposition of the enemy. We've got to begin to believe the word of God, even though we don't see at this point how that can happen, because the body of Christ in the world is actually like the body of Jesus on the cross. All the bones are out of joint. But you know something? Resurrection. Put it back together. God is going to bring resurrection life to his church. Now, one more uh, thought on this slide. As I was seeking God about that, because I knew that they were in error in that, and it eventually brought me out of that group, the Lord said, the way of the eagle in the air is an invisible. The way of the serpent on the rock, you can't tell, you can't follow the path of the serpent on the rock. It's an invisible. The way of the ship in the sea is an invisible. And the way of a man with a maid. Why did that? Fat, fat man, or why did that beautiful lady fall in love with that fat, fat man? The way of a man with a maid. Not understandable. It's an invisible. And so God takes these things. And by the way, there's quite a few animals in Proverbs 30. And the scripture says every one of them has a prophetic element to it. Okay, now I've done studies on all three or all four of those, but we haven't got time to go into that. It is prophetic symbolism. And because Proverbs is a book of the end time, a book of the maturing of the sons or maturing of the church, we are going to see God use every one of these in Proverbs 30. Verses 24, 28, there are four things which are little upon the earth, but are exceedingly, what? Wise. The ant are a people not strong, yet they prepare their meat in the summer. The conies are but feeble folk, yet make their houses in the rocks. The locusts have no king, yet go up. Go they forth, all of them by arm, by bands, and the spider taketh hold with her hands and is in king's houses. Back in 1981, we came home from Christian community. And I'm going through a number of things. And the Lord said, I want you to set aside your study of the scriptures and study the end. I rebuke the devil. <laughs> he said, do you want to be wise? I said, yeah, I want wisdom. He said, then I did not ask you or suggest it. I said in, I think it's Proverbs 6, consider, go to the ant, thou sluggard, Bill. Consider her ways and be wise. That's a command that is not 
a suggestion. So I took six months and I studied the ant, produced a 75-page workbook. And I came out of that a lot wiser than when I went in. Because God began to show me types and shadows that are prophetic of things in the end time. And in the body of Christ. I haven't got time to go into that, but it, it's a phenomenal study. Now, okay, prophetic symbol, the ant, the coney is actually related to the hippopotamus. Okay? But what is the relationship that you need to study there? Because you stay within the, the, I call them the parameters that God gives. The relationship of the coney to the rock. The coney is so small that when the predators come, he backs into a hole in the rock. And it's safe because the predators can't get him. His relationship to the rock is the prophetic issue there. The low, uh, and they're feeble folk. By the way, that's what in Nehemiah's day, that's exactly what Sanballat and Tobiah called the Jews. What do these feeble Jews? Will they do this? And of course the answer was, yes, they're going to do it. Because their dependency is upon the rock of Israel. The locusts have no king, yet go they forth all of them by bands or by armies. That word bands is armies. They have no king. They have no visible leadership. By the way, that's an awesome study as well. The spider takes hold with her hands and is in king's palaces. When we lived uh, in Canada, we bought a, an old house. I mean, an old house was built in the 18, about 1855. And uh, it had a basement or a, a cellar. It didn't have a basement. A basement is blocks and nice cement floor. A cellar is ground floor and, and the, you know, and every time we had to go down where we had the um, soft water, water softener, and our well was in the basement as well, you'd walk through the spider webs. And you'd get them all out of there, and you think you got them all, and half an hour later you have to go down again for something, and you walk into the spider web. The tenacity of the spider, and he is in kings or she is it's a she she is in king's palaces and usually you'll find in all honesty women have more tenacity than men we may not like that but that's usually true isn't it Our proverbs 30 verses 29 and 31 there be three things which go well yea four are comely in the going a lion which is strongest among the beasts and doesn't run away from anybody. Thank God he's the lion of the tribe of Judah. A greyhound. What are they known for? Speed. A he-goat. That's the one that always makes excuses. Yes, but. Yes, but. Yes. <laughs> and a king against whom there is no rising. Okay, so as we look at these, these are all prophetic. They're not just mentioned because he didn't understand them. They are prophetic because the beginning of the chapter says, this is a prophecy. In Proverbs 30, 18 and 19, the key to understanding the prophetic symbolism there is the phrase, the way, the way in which each case in each case, is an invisible directing our attention to the Holy Spirit to reveal the invisibles to us and apply that revelation to our lives and the lives of others. We have got to begin to move from the visible to the invisible. If I could put it this way, you are going to live in the invisible for eternity. You don't want culture shock when you get to heaven. <laughs> okay, it's important to be reminded that this chapter of Proverbs 
calls it prophetic. And I believe that we can read that and go back and say, okay, God, you said it's prophetic. What in this chapter are you calling to me for? What, what is witnessing with my spirit? What, how do you want to speak to me from any one of these animals? And he may, like he did with me, say, the ant is yours. Now, eventually he took me to the locusts and all the others. So that, and, and that's why I know about them, because the Lord made me study through them. But, and he said, Bill, keep the parameters that the scripture gives. There, there's a, a fellow that wrote a book of types and shadows. And I mean, the book is tremendously done. Profession, I mean, professional with glossy pictures, all nine yards. But he went outside of what the scripture says about these different animals. He used the ones the scripture said, but he went outside them and drew other parallels. Those other parallels are not necessarily valid. Okay? In Psalm 19, verse 1, to the chief musician, a psalm of David, the heavens declare what? And the firmament, what does it do? Shows his handiwork. Note this was written by David. Possibly words and music were given prophetically and then handed to the chief musician to be played and sang in worship in David's tabernacle. And possibly in the tabernacle of Moses at Gibeon. So this was a... David was hearing something in the spirit. Now, when we look at the heavens, are we listening? When we look at the stars, are we listening? Interesting question, isn't it? There is yet a prophetic declaration of the heavens or the stars to be fully unveiled. When you stop and think about it, Noah had no book. Up until Moses, as far as we know, there was no written scripture. How did Noah hear? In that, how did the wise men, how were they able to interpret the signs in the heavens? As far as we know, they were not in relationship with God. But God spoke to them through astronomy, not astrology, astronomy because they were observers of what the heavens declare are we hearing that and so God will give us specifically individually certain focuses through which he will speak to us certain any of these that we're talking about okay now, it's quite possible that Noah and Abraham both heard from God through the stars of the heavens, as did the Magi at the birth of Jesus. The function and movements of the earth God uses to speak prophetically to those that listen. Now, let me draw our attention to something that, that in the days that we live in. Earthquakes are increasing. Volcan volcanic eruption is increasing. What are those things saying? The earth is groaning and travailing. Now, wait a minute. When I go to Matthew 24, and I begin to read, it says these are the beginning of sorrows, or it can be translated clearly from the original, the beginning of birth pains. God is birthing something in the earth. And when we hear of earthquakes increasing, we hear of volcanic eruption increasing, we hear of floods increasing, we hear of increased hurricanes and increased violence in, in the earth. And I'm not talking about violence by humans, I'm talking about violence by weather. What is it? It's the earth groaning and travailing. And that means that the plan of God is almost ready to be fully birthed. 
The woman does not usually have birth pangs in the first month. She has morning sickness, but not birth pangs. But when the earth begins to travail, God is speaking. But if we're not reading the signs of the times, then we're not going to hear what God is saying. Now, three of the Three out of the four faces of the cherubim in Revelation 4 and 7, the lion, the ox, and the eagle, are animals. And according to Revelation 5.10, they're prophetic of companies of people. Now listen. Listen to what this says. And we want to read it slow, and we want to catch it. Revelation 5, 6 through 10. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are what? The seven spirits of God. That's a whole nother study in it. Sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne. And when he'd taken the book, the four beasts, who? The four beasts and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. Now, and they, who are they? And they sung. Who are they? The four beasts and the 24 elders. Now, that's important to see. Because of their testimony. I may know that out of, we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and. So listen to their testimony. And they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed who? Who's us? The four beasts and the 24 elders. So although there may be, and I'm not saying there aren't, although there may be four literal beasts, in fact there are, and four, 24 literal elders, there's a greater meaning, another layer of meaning here. Thou hast redeemed us, these two groups, or 28 groups, whichever way you want to look at it, represent a redeemed people. Now, they have been redeemed, how? By the blood of Jesus out of every kindred. How many kindreds? How many tongues? There are 2,000 languages that have never been written yet. Okay? And people group. How many people groups? How many nations? And thou hast made us unto our God, kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. How many know there's a lot of teaching in that verse? Okay? But we need to see that there's companies of people, that the four beasts, although they are symbolic, although they, I believe they're, they're literal beasts, they're literal creatures, let's put a call on that, creatures in the heavenlies that have the, the attributes that are given to these four, uh, given to the cherubim, they also represent a group of people within the body of Christ that God is making something out of. Remember, they said, thou hast made us. Not we have made ourselves. Not we have tried to get this. We've done this by our own. It's thou hast made us. Now that speaks of a process, doesn't it? We could say thou hast processed us to become kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. We are in process. We may not like it. Some days we don't understand it. But we're Revelation 4 and 7, and the first beast was like a lion, the second beast like a calf, the third beast had the face of a man, the fourth had a face of a flying eagle. Those are also found in Ezekiel 1.10 and Ezekiel 10.14. The same description. 
The face of man is the type of the gospel of Luke and one of the standards of Israel. When Israel went forth to war, there was a standard that went with them that had the face of a man. The face of the lion is the type of the gospel of Matthew where Jesus is presented as the king and the lion of the tribe of Judah. That was also Judah's standard, the lion. The face of the ox is the type of the gospel of Mark, the servant son, and also one of the standards of Israel. And then the face of the eagle is a type of the gospel of John, the divine son, and one of the standards of Israel. One day the Lord said to me, Bill, these are also, if, if what we just read in ch chapter 5 is true, these are also aspects of the gospels that people have let me work into their lives. There are companies of people who are going to show forth the, the, son, of, the son of man. There are companies of people who are going to manifest the lion of the tribe of Judah. There are companies of people who are going to be servants. And, and whatever they do, they're just serving. And they're called of God to do that. And that's God's vehicle to make them a king and a priest. And then, of course, there are those who are going to have revelation of the divine son and manifest that in the earth. And it will be their vehicle to being made kings and priests unto God. Now, the four faces represent four companies of people who will be walking in the fullness of the gospel through whom God will release the everlasting gospel of the kingdom. In Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel of what? Not the gospel of salvation. It's included. Not the gospel of the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the five ministry gifts and all the gifts of the Spirit. But there's a gospel of the king and his kingdom that is yet to be released in all the world for a witness unto all nations. Then shall the end come. God is beginning to deal with people about the difference between the, king, the church and the kingdom. The church is a vehicle of God to bring us to the kingdom. Okay? In Revelation 14, 6, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having what? The everlasting gospel. The everlasting gospel includes all of the covenants of God gathered together, the fullness of heaven being released into the earth having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Now, there are three perfect prophetic types. We're still dealing with prophetic types, even though we've gone here and there a little on our way. All, all others can only be taken with certain limitations. First of all, the tabernacle of Moses. This is considered a perfect type because God, in its, or because in its dedication, God approved it by his manifest presence. It came and filled the tabernacle. The temple of Solomon. And by the way, there are scriptures in Hebrews that really underscore the, perfect, the uh, perfectness of the pattern. Uh, the temple of Solomon. This as well was sealed as perfect with the manifest presence of God. Remember how Moses got the tabernacle pattern? Went up into the mount. And God gave him the pattern of things, it says, in the heavens. David said, I got this pattern by the writing of God's hand on me. Now, that's an Old Testament experience. Stop for a minute. That's an Old Testament experience. God writing his hand, with his hand, on David's heart. Now, that ties you into 2 Corinthians. Uh, is it chapter 5? 
You are our epistles read and known of all men, manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, not with pen and ink, on, uh, but with the spirit on the fleshly tables of the heart. David had that experience when God gave him the, the temple pattern. And then the third perfect type is the Lord Jesus Christ. He took all the types and shadows and showed us by his walk how to apply them in our lives. Let me say this. I, I, I can't overemphasize this, at least as far as I'm concerned, I can't. When I'm reading scripture, whether it be the Old Testament or whether it be the, the uh, epistles and the rest of the New Testament, in order to anchor what I'm hearing and seeing, I need to look at the life of Jesus. How did he manifest this word? Because he was the word made flesh. How many know I might need some revelation when I ask that question? I might need the Holy Spirit to lead me to an incident in the life of Christ in the Gospels. And I might need to see that in the light of the fact that he was walking out some aspect of the word. One of the problems in the church is church discipline. One of those nasty things, right? How did Jesus do church discipline? We go to Paul and we say it should be done this, 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 this. But how did Jesus do it? And so we need to go back and see, yes, I agree with what Paul said. Now, where can I find what Paul did in the life and the white life and outworking of the life of Jesus? Three perfect, uh, perfect prophetic types. If I can find it in the tabernacle of Moses, the temple of Solomon, somehow expressed in the life of Christ in at least seed form, then I can call it a true type and shadow. This has kept me from error. This statement, when God gave it to me, this statement has kept me from going into error. I often say I've been on the edge of truth or the rim of error, whichever you want to call it. I've walked there. But it's this statement that has kept me from going over the edge and going off into error. I might see it in the tabernacle of Moses. I might even somehow twisted in the temple of Solomon. But if I can't see it in the life of Christ, then what I'm seeing is not true revelation. Okay? So let's pray. Lord, would you teach me your symbolic language for me? I want to be one who learns to search out the matter. Holy Spirit, teach me how to do that. Some of you will search it out devotionally. That's right. That's okay. Some of you will search it out as, almost like an academic, scripturally, approaching it academically. But God will teach you and lead you how you are to search it out. Holy Spirit, teach me how to search out the matter. I give you permission to develop our special combination of language symbols conveying your will, mind, and purpose to me. Thank you so much that you love me to the extent that we can have our own special language. Thank you for the great varieties of ways you speak. I love you, Lord. And everybody, amen. I hope that helps.